A company called Enamelon has caught Wall Street's attention in a big way since its initial public offering last fall, having tripled in price since that time based on its breakthrough tooth decay technology. We're here today with Dr. Stephen Fox, the chairman, chief executive officer, and founder of Enamelon, and we do thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, I guess we'll start with the most recent news and work backwards. This week, I, I believe you announced uh, you were granted two new patents for this technology. Tell us about those two patents specifically, and then we'll talk about the other things. Yes, uh, those two patents are a continuation of the calcium phosphate technology. Uh, Enamelon originally licensed patents from the American Dental Association Health Foundation, uh, the first five patents, and now we subsequently have three patents actually. Uh, the last two deal with our own calcium phosphate technology uh, that will remineralize, restore, uh, renew tooth enamel, add calcium and phosphate back into tooth structure, strengthen it and harden it, and we believe that's the most important advance since fluoride was introduced in the late 1950s. In a moment, we'll get into more of those advances. But in terms of test marketing, I know that uh, that's starting to happen, and that'll be followed by a full-blown introduction later. What's the timeline for the toothpaste? Uh, we'll introduce uh, in test market our toothpaste into six cities over the next nine months. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll begin that, we believe, around the end of March, beginning of April. Uh, we've had a tremendous uh, uh, demand from the chains, superstores, drug stores, and chain stores. Uh, and then in uh, the first quarter of 1998, we'll go national uh, with our toothpaste sales. We're also developing chewing gum, mouthwash, uh, professional gel, food, candy, and uh, we hope to, uh, sometime in the next year, do some joint licensing and joint venture deals with some of the majors on those products. Give me an idea of, of the uh, level of breakthrough we're talking about uh, as opposed to existing products. Well, up until now, you've had fluoride, and fluoride has had its impact where it reduced cavities. But uh, to quote Ever Koop, who was a former Surgeon General of the United States, caries is the most prevalent disease known to mankind. In fact, 83% of the 17-year-olds in this country have cavities. And in fact, 40% of the 60-year-olds have lost all of their teeth. So there must be something that uh, has to occur in the last 40 years, and that's our breakthrough. And uh, this breakthrough will have an enormous impact, and it's been shown in animal studies to uh, repair cavities in 80% of the rats versus the standard fluoride toothpaste, which did nothing to give you an idea of the impact. So we think it's a quantum leap forward, and uh, what I like to say is Crest was to the 50s what Enamelon will be to the 21st century. Now, initially, the toothpaste and other products will have the Enamelon name on them, but eventually when you go into licensing, as you were mentioning before, that means other companies will be able to put their brand names on but have your technology. Exactly how will that work? Well, it depends. Uh, that remains to be seen. We've licensed uh, and trademarked uh, numerous names, uh, but um, copyrighted numerous names. But right now, we're staying with the Enamelon name, and uh, as far as the name on a chewing gum, that remains to be seen with, uh, when you make a deal with a company. Those things are negotiated, and we'll see how that goes. I'm quite sure you went into the IPO process with a bit of optimism, but are even you surprised at the level of success that the stock has had? Well, I'm the entrepreneur, uh, uh, so I'm not surprised as an entrepreneur. But um, logically speaking, I'm not surprised because uh, the fact of the matter is when you have a technology that uh, could change oral health care, uh, and affect everybody universally, uh, I don't see why uh, it's implausible that this thing is done uh, uh, the way it's done. Uh, I think that if you compare it to, f for instance, Amentadent, which in four years had $200 million in sales, uh, and companies are valued at four times sales, with, uh, certainly there's plenty of upside. Uh, if we had to achieve, uh, if we achieve those sales, we could have an $800 million valuation as an example. So certainly here at the $100 or $125 million valuation level, there's plenty of room to go, so am I surprised? No. And coming into test launch, that's exciting enough, the marketing of the product, uh, that I think that um, people get excited about it. Very interesting that even before your breakthrough, that toothpaste in general has proven to be an easier market to make an impact in than other consumer products. Uh, why is that? Well, the marketplace is only controlled uh, by Crest and Colgate uh, in quantity of 47%. Yeah. Uh, their market share has been depleted over the years. Uh, you've had a lot of other products that have made a big impact uh, over time and have eaten away at their market share. You have uh, Rembrandt, you have uh, Mentadent, you have Arm & Hammer. Uh, you have a lot of cosmetic claims that are making an impact. So the consumer is very receptive to new features and benefits, uh, new claims, and frankly, they're willing to pay for it. Uh, if you look at Colgate Platinum, uh, they'll pay $6 a tube. You look at Rembrandt, they'll pay $8 a tube. So there's no brand loyalty. Those days are over. Uh, if you ask somebody what they normally use, they might not even be able to tell you, but they certainly yeah. change an average of three brands per year. So you can see the consumer loyalty hasn't been there. So it's a very fractured market and a very competitive market.
I know you're going to be putting out this product on a contract manufacturing basis. Will your contractor have enough capacity should demand hit the way you anticipate? Yes, we'll be using uh, PECO Manufacturing, which is a division of West Pharmaceuticals. Uh, they have the capacity of 42 million tubes. Uh, we've added our own special equipment to their manufacturing line. Uh, so they're capable of producing what we need uh, in national sales. There are also other private label manufacturers all over the country which can add into that. Uh, so we feel we have adequate uh, manufacturing capability. What we didn't want to do was throw our money into a manufacturing facility because sure. I consider it to be a black hole. I'd rather put it into uh, marketing the product and advertising the product. And that's uh, where we're going with manufacturing. Give me the idea of the potential audience in terms of the fact that uh, you were mentioning before our interview that not only could it help those teens that you mentioned at the beginning of this interview, but even people like myself who grew up in the pre-fluoride era and uh, saw the drill many a time. Well, our all-family toothpaste will help everybody. Yeah. Uh, not only will it help young children and middle-aged adults, but we have a new population of people living between 60 and 90. So what we found now is that even though caries was on the decrease decades ago, it's now on the rise because you have a whole new population that more than compensates for the uh, children and age group from 0 to 17. So those people are getting cavities along the roots. Uh, they're also getting sensitive teeth. One out of five adults is affected uh, in that way because of periodontal disease. And they're also getting cavities along the roots. So our desensitizing line, which will follow our, uh, follow our all-family toothpaste launch, will help those people also in a considerable way. Tell me about the role that academic partnerships and alliances have played in this whole process. I understand they've been quite important. Well, yes. Uh, originally, the technology came from the American Dental Association. They have a long history of having developed important products, silver fillings, amalgams, uh, white fillings, sealants, uh, the dental mirror, the dental handpiece the dentist uses, the dental x-ray machine, the Panorex x-ray machine, impression materials that dentists use. So the American Dental Association has a long history of having done this. Uh, we originally worked with them with NIH grants and National Institute of Dental Research grants. Uh, the National Institute of Standard and Technology was the facility that we worked in originally. Uh, they have a $350 million annual budget and 3,500 scientists. So we've been very fortunate in that we've had American Dental Association involved, uh, the federal government involved, and then of course when we licensed the technology, uh, we raised capital and took it to fruition ourselves. How is it that these products are not being put out by a Colgate Palmolive or a Procter & Gamble. If you were just studying this as a business case, you would wonder that, and I do wonder that. Well, in the toothpaste uh, arena, uh, we have, uh, and of course the other products also, we have six, uh, pa eight patents that have been granted right now, two more were granted yesterday, and we have at least 10 more patent pending. So a combination of 18 patent and patent pending are a tremendous barrier to entry uh, that I think is quite formidable. So that's the first uh, protective barrier mm -hmm. that would keep them out. And um, it took many, many years, 15, 20 years, to bring this to fruition. So I feel that we're very, very uh, far ahead and have a lot of protective barriers that uh, will eliminate the competition uh, in calcium and in phosphate uh, uh, toothpaste uh, areas. Throwing in the caution that this would be a forward-looking statement, it would only be a projection, et cetera, et cetera, would you feel comfortable with the idea that profitability might ensue after the successful introduction of the toothpaste in the first well, quarter next year? I don't predict for a living, but I'm certain that uh, somewhere along the line, as our sales ramp up and we achieve, uh, for instance, again, uh, to make it an analogy, if we do what Mentadent has done, and in four years they got up to $200 million in sales, uh, will be quite profitable, I'm sure. And uh, the other toothpaste companies are quite profitable. So certainly with the most important therapeutic claim in the last 40 years, I can't imagine that we won't do well. Do you, do you ever feel like people are saying to you, uh, do you how, how did you become an overnight success and only, uh, when you've been working at it for 15 years and now right, you're an overnight right. success, do you ever get a lot of that? What I tell people is if you work all day and all night, you're bound to get lucky. Uh, it's certainly not an overnight success, obviously. Yeah. Uh, I, I had to get an education first, and then I had to go out for four years and raise money privately. Right. I raised $4 million myself, and I raised $2 million from Allen & Company. And as everybody knows, going public is never easy. Only 800 companies did it this year, I think, in yeah. the United States. So you work hard, you work all day and all night, and eventually, uh, if you have the right idea and you work at it and it's honest, uh, you'll develop the right uh, project and bring it to fruition. What's been the reaction to this among your fellow dentists? Uh, it might be interesting to be a fly on the wall in one of those conversations. I think there, you know, the dental profession has always gotten behind fluoride. Uh, when yeah. fluoride was introduced, they introduced it in the water, uh, they presented it in their dental offices, they put it into toothpaste. Uh, it's a disease. And uh, just like the polio vaccine came along, it didn't put physicians out of business. The dentists will have uh, cosmetic dentistry to do, orthodontics, uh, oral surgery, endodontics, periodontics. So uh, I think they'll be enthusiastic about it. I think when their patients come to them 
and ask them, do you recommend this? They're certainly not going to say no, and they're not going to look foolish. They're going to recommend what's good for their patients on a moral basis. Uh, we'll also supply them eventually with a professional gel. We're going to educate them, bring them into the fold. In fact, we hope that later on we can develop ways for them to diagnose demineralization at an earlier stage uh, than an x-ray machine would at this stage of the game. So we really hope to bring them into the forefront of where dentistry is going and oral health care is going in the next uh, century. Now, you're, you obviously already were a good businessman showing the ability to raise money and all, all that stuff, but despite that, since you've gone public, what's it been like making the transition to someone who not only uh, practices dentistry but suddenly has to answer investment community type questions day after day? Well, for most of the time, I've put my drill down. Uh, yeah. I become, I, I practice more infrequently than I, I did before. But, but what I meant was that you got mostly dental questions in the old days, and well, now it's more monetary I think that, in nature. You know, having lived through the project, I can yeah. answer these questions from the dental point of view, from the uh, business point of view, because I did my own private placements and yeah. I'm running the company. I've got a wonderful team. We have 14 full time employees with tremendous marketing uh, experience and tremendous experience in the toothpaste uh, industry. So I think if you're honest and you answer the questions honestly and, and you work hard and you have the right people around you and the capital is there, uh, which all of those things are, uh, you can succeed and the transition has been an easy one. Tell me about the rest of your management team. I know that's one thing Wall Street likes to keep an eye on, that one person, if you yanked him out, wouldn't, the whole company wouldn't collapse on top of itself. So tell me about the rest of your management team. It's a team. wonderful team. Yeah. Uh, there's an old expression, know what you know and know what you don't know. The first thing I wanted was a president who had a lot of marketing experience. Uh, Brooks Cole uh, was president of the Mentholatum. He took them from 50 to $120 million in sales. He was vice president of marketing and sales at Vicks and Avon, uh, where he managed Lavoris and NyQuil. Uh, he was vice chairman of the uh, over-the-counter pharmaceutical board. Uh, so he has tremendous marketing and, and presidential experience. Uh, our head of uh, uh, clinical research and product development uh, developed the Arm & Hammer baking soda toothpaste for Church & Dwight. Uh, Tony Winston, who is our head of uh, clinical science, has 60 patents to his name, 14 of which are in oral health care, which is unprecedented. Uh, we have other, uh, our engineers from Arm & Hammer, one of our other, other scientists are out of Arm & Hammer. Our scientific advisory board, I think, is the finest uh, in the industry. Uh, General Baskar was the assistant surgeon general of the United States. He uh, formed Atrix. He was vice chairman of Atrix. Uh, he also was a consultant to the board of directors at Vidant. Uh, Joseph Henry, uh, is the former dean at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine, where I'm currently on the faculty right now. Uh, you've got Dr. Bruce Merrifield, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. He also was on the board of directors at Vidant. Uh, so we have a wonderful Dr. Tanzer is one of the foremost authorities on animal trials in the U.S., uh, chairman of two departments at the Medical and Dental School at the University of Connecticut. So we have a wonderful team uh, uh, working to bring this to fruition. You pointed out earlier that the marketplace has shown a willingness to support prices above that which have been traditional for toothpaste, mouthwash, etc. Mm -hmm. Can you, at this point, predict uh, a certain price level for the products, or does yes. that sort of remain to be seen? No, I can. Uh, we're sort of, uh, we feel that $3.50 in that general area where mint and dent has been priced is a good price. Okay. We don't want to be as high as $6 for a Colgate Platinum. We don't want to be as high as Rembrandt at $8. All of them are successful. Uh, but we don't want to be as low as 250 where a Crest and Colgate is because I don't think people will, well, people will say, well, is it any different if it's the 250? It's sort of a psychological thing. So you want to be price sensitive to what people can afford, but at the same time, you want to be price sensitive to what will bring a lot of money to the bottom line, and I think that's about where we would be. One of the uh, important initial questions, of course, is getting the shelf space. Uh, do you anticipate that that uh, will go well? What's your feeling right now? Well, I used to predict and say it will. Now I can say it has. Uh, all of the okay. major chains in our test markets have uh, given us commitments for product. Uh, we've had no requests for slotting fees. So uh, all of the things that we hoped would happen are happening. We'll have displays in all of the stores. Uh, so we're, we're starting off in a very, very successful fashion. Yeah, just in general, is shelf space less of a problem in this particular portion of consumer products than it would be in, say, you know, for cookies and crackers, which, you know, there are wars and well, soda and things like shelf that? shelf space is hard to get, but yeah. when you have an exciting product, which we have, the uh, uh, retailers are very uh, uh, interested in putting it on the shelf. I mean, here we have a situation where they can mark up the product 35%, yeah. and they can make money. Crest and Colgate is a loss leader, and they don't make any money on it. So they're very enthusiastic about having a new product with a new claim uh, that will bring people into the stores and also make money for them. So that's uh, a very big positive for us. Oh, and, and finally, obviously, the moment you've been pointing towards is when the products hit the shelves and the growth starts. Uh, what plan do you have in place for, for managing what might be spectacular growth and just keeping your hands on everything and making sure it goes well? Well, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. Uh, if we have to expand a little bit, we will. 
uh, but certainly staying lean and mean is the best way to run a business. Uh, we're going to uh, just keep doing what we've, been, what we've been doing. We've been successful at it, and uh, we, we, we will stay with that. Okay, we do appreciate your taking the time to join us today, and we wish you continued good it's luck. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Dr. Stephen Fox, Chief Executive Officer and Founder of Enamelon, he joined us here today in New York City. I'm Peter Schack now for NBC Private Financial Network.